Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this informational webinar about the Betty Irene Moore Fellowship Program for Nurse Leaders and Innovators. My name is Megan Hansen, and I'm the Communications and Marketing Specialist for the program. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to go over a few Zoom features that we'll be using today. Like most webinars, only the host will be speaking, but we will be using the chat function to ask questions. So when you do have a question, simply go ahead and type it in the chat. Our team is going to be looking through the questions and consolidating them, and we'll be reviewing and providing answers at the end of the session. We are also recording this webinar, and we'll be sending you a recording in the next couple of days. And the plan is to also post the recording on our website. And now I want to go ahead and introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Heather M. Young who is the National Program Director for the Fellowship. Take it away, Heather. Hi, Megan, thank you so much. And welcome everyone. I'm Heather Young and I'm joined today by Elena Siegel, who's the Associate Director of the, of the National Program. We're so glad you could be here today to join us for this informational webinar about the Fellowship Program and hope we can answer your questions. We're very excited about this opportunity and we're very glad that you've shown such interest. We think it's a really important opportunity as the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation is funded to advance nurse leadership in our country. They're really interested in advancing the next generation of leaders and innovators, and that's what we're here to talk about. Our agenda for today's session will cover a number of topics. We're going to give you an overview of the program, the eligibility, the curriculum, and the application process. And as Megan mentioned earlier, please type your questions into the chat and we'll address those at the end of the formal presentation. I'll go through the basics of the program and then we'll entertain questions. But feel free to write as you go. We'll be compiling those questions. So we'll get on with it and I'll, give, I'll begin to give you um, an, an overview of the program. This fellowship came about for a very important reason. Um, and the, the picture that you can see in front of you right now are the people that are responsible for us all being here today. The Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation was founded by Gordon Moore, who was the founder of Intel. And he, as you know, changed the world. He's probably influencing your computer right this very minute. He invented the semiconductor chip, and he developed a whole new way of thinking about computing and computing science. And he really did change the world with his innovation and his leadership. Betty, his wife, had the experience of being, as many women in, of her time and her generation and women today, a caregiver in her family. She cared for a number of different members who needed care. And as she got older, they're both in their 90s and living well um, and, and doing well at this point themselves. As she got older, she was realizing how much the healthcare system really wasn't as supportive as it could be for families and people needing care. About 20 years ago, she was in a hospital one night, and a nurse came in and offered her her insulin. And she said, I'm not diabetic. And she was given a large dose of insulin, um, a, a, even after she said that she shouldn't receive the dose. Now, most people, when they have a, a, an incident like that and have some adverse events from it, as she did, and as her roommate did as well, most people think about suing or doing something negative. But Betty Moore thought, you know, this is an opportunity she saw what nurses do and the capacity that nurses have to make a difference. And she felt that if nurses were equipped with the, the skills and the, and the education to be able to think in terms of systems and the authority to lead, that we could make a huge difference in health and health care. We happen to agree with Betty, and we're so delighted that the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation has taken her, her recognition of that to a very high level and have become the, the largest funders of nursing and nursing education in the world. This fellowship is their third initiative. The first was over a decade ago in the hospitals in the Bay Area, where they funded over 100 hospitals to do quality improvement around nurse-sensitive outcomes. The second big initiative they had was the Betty I. Moore School of Nursing at UC Davis, where they had a vision for a school that would prepare leaders for the future, with just the kinds of systems thinking that they think is important, and we agree. Um, I had the privilege of being the founding dean of the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing, and Dr. Siegel was a founding faculty member along with me there. This fellowship is the third investment. And the goal of this fellowship is to accelerate leadership and innovation in nursing. 
They're very interested, and we all are, in the next generation of leaders. And we recognize that for the complexity of health and health care, the diversity of our communities, we need to have a very new generation of people to lead. And we're interested in diverse perspectives and, and approaches, and we're interested in looking at it across sectors, so academia, but also in service and health systems. We're hoping that the people who participate in the fellowship uh, build their leadership capacity, expand their network, and build, and build their confidence to take creative ideas to fruition. We're funded for five cohorts of fellows, and the current application period is open for our second cohort. So we're really delighted that you're here and you're interested in that. I want to tell you a little bit about who's on our team. You're going to meet Elena Siegel in a moment, the Associate Director of the program. Jenna Kessbell is the Associate Director of Operations. Monica Escada is our Program Manager. Kristen Venditelli is Project Manager. Dan Carter, Project Coordinator. And Megan Hansen, you had the privilege of meeting earlier on. She takes care of all things communications. This is a really wonderful team, and they're all here to help you as you go through the process and are integrally involved with the fellows throughout the program. I'm going to ask Elena to talk a little bit about our National Advisory Council. Hello. Welcome, everyone. We are so fortunate to have an amazing group of advisors for this program, and they're involved with all aspects of the program and mentoring. They come from nursing. They represent nursing, medicine, computer science, um, industry, health policy, and they are very engaged, and we draw from their expertise for all aspects. And uh, you might want to check out the website. Their bios are there, and you'll be very excited to see um, this extraordinary group that works with us. Next slide. We are also very fortunate to have our partners. Uh, Dr. Young just talked about the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation and the support that they have offered for it to make this program a reality. We also have an extraordinary group of faculty from the Graduate School of Management led by Dean Rao um, Umano. And he, um, he is leading a group of faculty that are involved in helping us shape the curriculum for this program. And if you look at some of the opportunities, we have leadership, design thinking, systems thinking, networking, and innovation um, approaches to really moving work to that next level to have a national impact. And we work very closely with them on designing all aspects of the curriculum, and we're excited to be working with them. I'm going to talk a little bit about the fellowship itself. It's, it's really targeting early to mid-career nursing scholars and innovators, and we define early to mid-career by the number of years out from the PhD. We wanted to have people who are at, a, at sort of a common level and got their feet under them after completing their PhDs and still in a phase where acceleration of their work could really benefit them. So this year's applicant pool are people who've received PhDs between 2011 and 2016. The fellowship also includes, as Elena mentioned, a leadership and innovation curriculum. This curriculum is delivered um, in an intensive each year of the three years of the fellowship, a one-week intensive that all fellows are expected to attend, as well as monthly meetings where we have ongoing discussions around the important themes and content in the curriculum. Mentor support is also really vital for the fellowship, and fellows have two mentors. Uh, they self-select a mentor, someone who can help them with their project and or their leadership journey. And then once you're accepted into the program, we have a conversation with you about, about what else you're needing and what, what would also enhance your, your mentorship. And the National Program Office works with you to find national mentors. The mentors don't have to be nurses. They don't have to be at your organization. And they don't have to be someone you worked with before necessarily. It's also not bad if you have worked with them before. It's really about the match of having a mentor that matches what you need for this program and your ability to articulate that and the mentor's ability to say what they can do to help you and their commitment as well. So the mentors both work with the fellows throughout the program, meeting regularly and supporting them as they complete their projects and also with the leadership activities that are part of the program. The three-year fellowship provides $450,000 in project funding. 
and that funding is available to you directly as to fund your time, 30% of your time, as well as the expenses for your project and for your leadership journey. In addition, the institutions receive a $50,000 um, fund at the beginning of the fellowship, and that's in lieu of indirect costs. We don't do indirect costs, but the $50,000 is made as a, as a grant to the institution in recognition of that. The dean or the, the leader of the institution has the latitude to decide what to do with that 50000 and in the letter from that person, they would describe how they will use that money. Deans have chosen very different things, and the reason we make it open is that institutions are really different about how they, how they take in funds and what their capacity is with funding. Some have used the money to offset the cost of replacing a fellow in, in teaching. Others have put it into a fund for faculty development for, for other faculty. Others have used it as overhead. So it's really it's up to the dean to justify how that money will be uh, used. <clears throat> we select about 10 fellows per year. In our first year, we had 11 fellows. We can go to the next slide. I'd like to introduce you to them. We were so delighted to have such a, a highly qualified and competitive pool in the first year and we selected these 11 scholars. And they're actually, you can see, from all across the country. I'm very excited about the, the diversity of interest in this group. They range from people interested in babies all the way up to older adults and end of life. They're interested in across systems from, from acute care to community-based care to systems and policy. They have interest, uh, shared interest in health equity. A number of them have a very strong interest in technology and enabling care and artificial intelligence. They have, uh, they're innovative and they're exciting, and I encourage you to look at their bios and the projects that they're doing as a way to get a sense of the kinds of things that uh, were successful last year. But don't feel constrained by what you see. When you meet these fellows and you look at this group, I'm expecting the next group to be different again, and I hope that you will, you will show up with your application with your authentic self. Go to the next slide. So in the curriculum itself, um, there are a number of different activities. The, it's really designed for the two main purposes, which are leadership and innovation capacity. And the, the curriculum with the faculty from the Graduate School of Management, we're bringing the leaders in the field, in their, in their field, with the content that enriches these topics. So in leadership, we look at both where you are on your journey and who you are as a leader and your aspirations and recognize that leaders are really different. Leaders come in all sorts of ty types and styles. Um, leaders uh, uh, work at different levels in organizations. They work in different ways, and they lead in different endeavors. And so there's a lot of diversity in what leadership actually means. And we encourage you to figure out what it means to you and what your path is going to be as a leader. So the courses help to do that. There's also work around how to lead teams, how to work and think together, how to, how to manage people, how to negotiate. Um, there will be topics around communication and how to talk to different stakeholders that you have to influence as a leader. So all of these activities occur, many of them are during an annual convocation in the last week of July. And when you sign up uh, with the application, you have to commit to being available for that. This last year, we had to go to a virtual conference. We're hoping that we'll be able to be in person next year, but we don't know yet. We're going to make that decision in the early part of the year, but the timing is, is firm. We have we use the Canvas educational platform for online education, and in between our meetings together, we, we will have opportunities to post resources and have conversations in an asynchronous way. And as I mentioned, we have the self-selected and program-appointed mentors, and they'll work very closely with you. They also work with each other. We have some meetings with mentors to help them to build their capacity to support fellows appropriately. And we also want alumni to stay involved. So we continue to fund people to come back for convocations after the fellowship is completed. When you look at your budget, any time we ask you to travel, to come to us, the funding for that would be part of the National Program Office, and you don't have to fund that yourself. Next slide, please. I'm going to talk a little bit about eligibility. There are two types of eligibility. The first is where you work, and the second is who you are. The where you work question, there are two kinds of institutions we're interested in. 
faculty at Eligible Nursing, Academic Nursing Program, and then we have a list that's on the website, and you can look at the website to see if your university is on that list. That group of, of eligible institutions is looked at every year with our National Advisory Council, and we look at the pool, and we want to make sure that, that the academic institutions are demonstrating commitment to nursing science and scholarship. And we look at, the, look at it in different ways. There are certain um, indicators that we think about, such as whether there's a PhD program, what the funding record looks like, what are the senior faculty um, and their capacity to mentor and support. Those kinds of issues come into play as we discuss. We also are looking for diverse communities. They're looking for different types of academic programs So within nursing. So we, we look at a, a variety of different criteria, and that gets posted on the website. We are also interested in nurse scientists and scholars who are at major health systems or organizations. This is harder to find because there are many, many possibilities in this area of eligibility. It could be a governmental agency. It could be a health system, a hospital system. It could be a public health agency. It could be a tribal community. There are a variety of different ways that people might be active with their scholarship. What we're interested in and, and what the applicant has to talk about in the application is, is how the organization has demonstrated commitment to your scholarship. We really want to make sure that, that fellows who are enrolled are able to get the support of their institution for this important work. So that's something that, you, that you'll need to document in your, in your uh, application. As far as applicants themselves, PhD. This program is limited to PhDs. We're not, um, at this time, admitting people with DNPs or EDDs or other kinds of uh, uh, doctoral degrees. Um, and this really goes back to the commitment at the foundation in terms of the scientific knowledge generation that's so valued by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. So having, PhD, having a PhD is, is, is indicative of that kind of a commitment. So the, the dates of, con of conferring are the calendar year, 2011 to 2016. So any time in those years, if you received your PhD, you would be eligible for this year's cohort. Next year, we'll go for 2012 to 2017. So that it's a rolling type of a date issue for our uh, admitted, admitted cohort. We want to see at least one degree in nursing or nursing science. So it could be a bachelor's with a PhD in informatics, for example. Bachelor's in Nursing. The fellows need to commit to at least 30% effort starting July 1st and throughout the entire process of the, of the fellowship. And, and this is part of the conversation with both the dean as, as demonstrating that commitment and the availability of the fellow to engage and the fellow talking about that commitment. Also committing to attend the annual convocation. You'll learn as much from your colleagues as you learn from us. And that's something that is only learned when you're together with those people through those experiences. So we expect that commitment for people to be together. Um, and as I said, it might be virtual and it might be in person. We're, we're planning for both at this point, and we'll make a decision in early 2021. And then also to commit to the online me monthly meetings, as well as the mentorship and learning activities. Each fellow will develop their own individual development plan with activities that they choose. And that would be something that you're committing to complete. I'm going to ask Elena to talk about the project itself. Thank you, Heather. So there are many different types of projects that you can propose and take on for this fellowship. And we're giving you three, the three primary examples here. A standard research study, such as something that you might be submitting um, for NIH funding, a traditional study, which is absolutely um, appropriate for this grant. Another approach, which is a little bit different, it has to do with that translation of taking the evidence and moving it into practice. So it could be um, a proposed project that is evidence-based, so it's a rigorous study that involves implementation science. Again, how do we take that evidence and embed it into everyday practice? The third approach has to do with an invention, and we have some fellows in our current program that are involved with invention and a rapid cycle design process where they're collecting data, they are continuing to improve, they're testing it, and this is a rigorous process. So there's lots of opportunities for you. We don't want you to feel like you've got to stick to one or the other. You'll see what some of the projects are that our current fellows have are working on, and we want you, as, as I heard, 
Heather talk about earlier, bring your um, individualism to this. Think about what you are passionate about to advance the science and generate new knowledge in an area that is so important to you. Thanks, Elena. And you'll notice it's not a typical application process with the project. Do you want to talk a little around that, Elena, about how we structured the application for the project? Yes. Thank you. When you look at the application, you'll see that the questions are a little bit unusual. As Heather said, it is not a straight, um, regular, full method section, full significance section and problem statement. We're not looking for you to be citing a lot of literature. We're looking for your voice, your passion, your interest. We want you to share with us what you're thinking in general. You will have the first six months of the fellowship to refine your proposal, work out a lot of the details along with your mentors and some input from us as well as it's refining. We appreciate that being part of the convocation, having the different um, educational curricular offerings, you'll be thinking about the problem that you're interested in in new ways. So when you submit your application, what we want to hear from you is your vision, your passion, for what it is you would like to accomplish, where this work will take, um, uh, address an important gap. And then we will continue to work with you. So you do have to have a general outline of an idea of what you want, and we will ask you to talk about it. But the fine detail, as you would put in a standard research project, is not what we're looking for. We want to hear your voice and your innovation ideas. Thanks, Elena. And it was interesting to see how much the, the convocation and the conversations with the National Advisory Council did influence people's projects and their ideas. So that's, um, it's wonderful to have that fluidity. It's unusual because with many grant applications, you, you write your grant and you commit. By the time you get funded, you think, oh, wait, I wish I could have changed that a little bit. And in this case, you get to do that. I'm going to take a few moments to talk about elements of successful applications. And this is what we saw last year um, in applications in our pool, those that came forward as the strongest and were selected as fellows. And if you can take this list and look at your, maybe ask someone that you're working with uh, to review your application in light of these bullets, they may help you to strengthen your application. So the first is really a strong description of leadership aspirations and the potential to bring innovation to the leadership journey. And when we think of leadership, as I introduced earlier on, it's a very diverse concept, and it doesn't mean necessarily that I want to have a certain role in life. Um, I'm going to be a dean or I'm going to be a, a research director. It's about what do you want to influence? How do you want to have leave your mark? How do you want to improve the world? How do you want to improve health and health care? Those are the kinds of things we're interested in when you talk about your leadership aspirations. We also want to hear what it is that's your passion. What, what are the ideas? What's the vision of what you think is important in this world that you want to change? A description about your vision for an important health or health care issue. Um, because we're really wanting to know a little bit about where we think you, you think you'll have your impact. And then how the project that you're proposing will help to advance that vision. The next thing is about your own trajectory. So you're thinking about your career trajectory. And how will this fellowship make a difference? As I mentioned earlier on, the foundation is very interested in accelerating the next generation of leaders, helping give you a boost in your direction. So we want to know, where do you think you're going? How are we going to help you boost? And then finally, we want to make sure that your mentor and your institution are supportive and that they're able to document both the commitment to your time and also to your ongoing development, uh, because we want this to benefit those around you as well, and we want to make sure that your mentor is, is ready to go on this journey with you. Next slide, please. I'm going to turn it over to Elena. I think she'll tell you more about how to apply. Great. So if you look at the website, you will see that there's a link that you can click to request um, a link to the application. And this will be your own personal link, so don't share it with anyone. And it allows you to save and to move forward. You've all had probably experience with that before. It also provides you with a link to a PDF of the full application so that you can see what's coming and what you want to prepare for with the Qualtrics application. 
So you'll want to go in, get your approval, get your link. It'll be sent to you via email, I think. You can start on that, but then also have a PDF of what the questions are to prepare. The second part of the application, which is separate from the Qualtrics, but it, which is required, is a list of documents that are also outlined in that PDF and at our website that we would need you to compile and, and into one PDF and then send in an email to us. That includes your bio sketch, your dean, dean's letter of support, your mentor's letter of support, and their bio sketch, and your budget. Those are examples. And there is a specific order that we would like those um, compiled in and then sent off. So once you complete that Qualtrics application and you hit submit, remember that, that you're not quite done yet. You then also want to have this PDF of all of the documents also sent in by the due date. Next slide. So here is a list of just the dates that you can be looking at as we're talking. We are currently in the application process right now, and that goes through 5 p.m. Pacific time on December 1st. Um, in the week of February, applicants will hear from us about interviews if they've been selected for an interview. And then the interviews take place later in the month of February, and we will be conducting those by Zoom. You will hear back from us by March 1st regarding acceptance into the program. And then in April, we announce the full cohort and we officially begin July 1. And as Heather spoke about earlier, we have a convocation, which is time where you would be here in Sacramento with us. And it's in the last two weeks, um, sometime during that last two weeks of July, we're still working out the dates and we're watching and looking at whether this will be virtual as last year was or if we'll be able to have an in-person convocation. Thanks, Elena. So at this point, we're happy to move into <clears throat> discussion and answer some of your questions. I see there's been some action in the chat. I, I really appreciate your questions. Keep them coming. And Monica and Kristen, my colleagues, are, have been watching it closely, and they'll be posing the questions to us, and we'll be happy to answer. So please go ahead, Monica and Kristen. Thank you so much, Heather. I'm going to go ahead and ask uh, the first question. Uh, is it possible to have two, two chosen co-mentors, such as a primary and a secondary mentor? Great question. And as I, I love it when people have lots of help in their lives and mentors, and, we, and many of us have mentors that do different parts of um, mentor us in different ways. It is possible to have more than one, but we want you to identify a primary mentor, one person who will be the primary responsible for you and, and throughout the program. We engage the primary mentor in some activities with the other mentors as well, and um, they have a particular role to play in terms of the fellowship. So identify a primary mentor, and, and you can absolutely um, justify why that person is the primary. And then a secondary mentor is, is also welcome. You can put your mentor on your budget um, for a, 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 you know, a nominal amount of, of funding. You can put your, co your, co your second mentor on if, if that person is a member of your project team and is needed to advance the project. So um, you're free on that. And if you don't, you don't have to fund the mentor if the mentor is already funded. So they just have to commit their time and their commitment to you for mentoring you and they don't have to be at your institution. Thanks, Heather. So the second question is, uh, this person comes from a large university and they wanted to know if the 50,000 would be sent to the university central administration or if it would go directly to the College of Nursing. That's a very savvy question. Thank you for that question. Um, it goes to the College of Nursing. It goes to your, your unit. As, as indirect costs. And then universities have different ways of dealing with that kind of funding, but it's not an indirect cost. So it would be a direct payment to your, your dean or the leader of the institution, your unit. Okay, um, the next question is, can the 30% be accomplished through a combination of academic year and summer effort? So the fellowship is year round. 
and I recognize that some people are on nine-month appointments, and you notice that the convocation is in the middle of the summer, so if you're on a, a, a nine-month appointment, you would be coming out of your nine-month appointment to attend the fellowship. The 30% is expected as a year-round commitment, and so you need to work with your, with your organization about how to manage that and how to, how to put the funding that's appropriate to support you into your budget. Because institutions are so different and everyone has different arrangements, we left it pretty open so that in your own budget justification, you'll talk about how you're funding yourself and how that's working in the justification. Great. Thanks, Heather. The next question is about K awards and if someone with an active K award is a good candidate for this fellowship. So that's a really good question. And K awards are similar to also having really strong teaching responsibilities. It's whatever is a commitment that's substantial in your life, because I, I bet everybody who's applying is already fully occupied, fully committed. So whatever you're doing, you're going to need to find a way to get 30% time for the fellowship. So in your application, you're going to need to talk about if you have competing demands, how you're going to balance that. With a K award and you have an expectation of 75% engagement in a K award, you would need to talk about where there's overlap between this fellowship and the K award so that you could justify your time at 100%. And it might be that there's elements of your project that are overlapping. They shouldn't be heavily overlapping, though, because we want to fund your project that's separate from existing grant funding of other kinds of things. But it's a wonderful problem to have if you're juggling many people wanting to fund you, um, just talk about it in your application. And if you have a pending K award or other kind of a grant, talk about if you were to get both, what would you do? How would you manage? Because we don't want to fund something you're already funded for. Um, and many times with a program of research, there are different questions that you need to answer as building blocks for your total work. And so think about it as this project being to have having a little more fluidity than a NIH type of a grant, so sometimes people will use this fellowship, some of the other folks in the, in the pro program, to look at developing collaborations and developing innovations and rapid cycle testing of ideas that typically doesn't get funded by an NIH funding. Similarly, systems change is something that's hard to get funded from NIH. And so if you focus on systems and implementation science, you may have a chance of using this money in a different kind of a way. Thank you, Heather. The next question is, last year there was a nomination process from each institution. Is that not the case anymore? I'm sorry, Kristen, I didn't hear that well. Could you repeat? Sure. It says, sorry, last year there was a nomination process from each institution. Is that not the case anymore? Each institution, the, the dean or the leader of the institution, the CNO of a health system needs to needs to provide a letter of support. It's not so much of a nomination. Last year, we, we, we allowed up to two people from each organization to apply. And we found out in, in retrospect that that created quite a bit of, of trouble for people, actually. It was difficult to have two coming from the same institution. This year, we're asking for one. And we're asking the dean or the CNO to select the person they want to put forward. That's an internal process. We're not defining what that is. But if two applicants reach out from the same university to us, we're writing to the dean saying, we have interest from two of your faculty. Would you please work out within, internally who you would like to put forward? So it's very important that you communicate to your dean or your CNO that you're interested, that you're applying, so that that person's aware if there's more than one applicant um, coming from the organization. So another budget question. Can the yearly yes. budget exceed 150000 for year one since there is more supplies needed at this year? The budget total is 450000 over three years. Is it mandatory to have 150 each year? No, we do not restrict that. And on our website, I encourage you to look at the website closely because there's quite a lot of um, information on the website about budgeting. It's really about justifying your budget. And you, well, there are three elements. There's your project, your timeline, and your budget. And for some things, the timeline requires certain investments up front 
in other cases, people may not spend much in the first year and then have a lot more expense later on. So it's really up to you for how you do that. Thank you, Heather. I have another mentor question. Can you please speak a little bit about selection of primary mentors? For example, do you recommend that the mentor be within your institution or external? And do you recommend selecting someone who already has an established mentorship relationship uh, or develop a new relationship? You know, this is another one of those questions where you're probably going to wish I gave you more direction. What I'm, what I'm going to say is that um, you need to pick a mentor that's going to help you with your journey and one that's a really good match for what you're doing and for where you're going. And with the mentor, um, showing that that person has the skills and expertise and perspective that will help you. So some organizations, for example, may have a strong research office where there's a lot of availability of senior faculty to review grant proposals. Maybe the research piece isn't so needed as a primary mentor, but the, the fellow is saying, I need someone who knows how to lead. I want to be with a leader who's going to help me learn that. Elena, do you want to add to this? Because you've thought about this a great deal as well. Yes, I'm happy to. It really is a very exciting opportunity to think differently about mentorships, and, and I can't overemphasize Heather's point about who is going to help you with your journey? What are your needs? And it may not be a certain content area or a specific methodology, but it's something related to your broader career trajectory, which as we spoke about with the application, that is really important to us. It's, this fellowship is much more than one project. It's about how this project is a stepping stone to your leadership and innovation broadly as you advance your career. So you have opportunities to look both within your organization. It might be somebody that you've never formally worked with, but is committed to what your goals are and has the expertise to bring it. And it's a new opportunity to have that formal relationship with someone that you might not have otherwise. So it really is wide open. It's a very exciting opportunity for you to be thinking about what do I need? Who has the expertise that's going to help me get there? And talking with them and, and discussing all those details and planning it out. Yeah, and we don't have a, a grading preference, if you will. I, you know, I see some questions in the chat about what do we prefer. What we really, really prefer is that you're a good match and that the mentor is going to be available to you and has the expertise and the commitment to help you move along. We don't value who they are in any other way than that. And in terms of whether you fund them or not, that's not something that we look at as a criterion for whether it's a, you know, there's, there's nothing to do one way or the other with that. It's about your circumstance, because some mentors are fully funded, and part of their role is already mentoring you. And so there's not a need to fund them. In other cases, it might be someone who is not getting any funding to support you, and it's totally appropriate to fund them for that. So it's in your, just, you know, your budget justification is um, your opportunity to talk about your decisions around budget, why you're funding or not funding something. Okay, so next question is, uh, once funded, are there rebudget or carryover restrictions that we need to consider? So we really strongly encourage people completing in the three years. Um, we're not interested in having extended, no-cost extensions on projects. So we're encouraging people to have a two-year project that starts the January after funding and lasts for two years. So there's a six-month buffer on the back end to wind it up, to start dissemination, and to work on the next step. Um, we very much uh, do not want to be carrying things longer. And the reason for that is, is it isn't just the project. It's not just a grant project. It's a fellowship. So it's an engagement with each other. And so keeping people involved and engaged for the three years and making progress on their project is a very high value for us. So it would only be under extraordinary circumstances that we would look at extensions. And, of course, things happen. People need to take leaves for many reasons, and those are the kinds of things we would look at. But it's not something that you can count on in terms of, you know, that you can move a project forward in that way. So you have to think very realistically about what can you accomplish in two years and commit to do that.
Thank you so much, Heather. Uh, the next question is, I have an active NIH grant focused on knowledge generation and research infrastructure. Would it be appropriate fellowship to propose a project that builds on that, but is focused on implementation and clinical translation? Or are you only interested in brand new projects completely separate from any existing projects? We would love you to build on what you're doing. The whole idea is to advance your work and to, and to absolutely take it to the next level. We'd like to see innovation in what you're doing. So you can't just make what you're doing now a little bit bigger. That would not be considered particularly innovative. But doing something different with it, taking a different approach in it, is something that would be absolutely um, appropriate to do. Elena, do you want to address that question a little more? Sure. The focus on starting with building on something that you're generating new knowledge, and then for this proposed project to be translating that and, and, and uh, conducting a study to actually implement, using an implementation science approach, so a rigorous um, methodology that helps us move the evidence that you're generating into the practice community is absolutely welcome and it's completely appropriate for this project. You would want to explain and differentiate them clearly in your proposal at how this proposed project is building on and is distinctly different, but it is advancing that work. Great, thank you. So the next question is, with so much uncertainty and external stressors in these times, if selected and awarded, is the fellowship movable if the PI changes organizations? Yes, the fellowship would be movable because you're awarded the fellowship. Um, and you would have to negotiate with your new leader the 30% time if you were to move organizations. And the funding goes to the first institution in the first year. So there would not be additional funds available for your second organization. Um, but that's something, those kinds of circumstances are the kinds of things I think about as great communication opportunities. So if you're in a situation where things are changing for you, we really open, uh, welcome and encourage open communication because this is a partnership between our office and the fellows. And the world is really upside down right now and we've seen a lot of changes and issues We've done a lot of um, rethinking around projects because of the uh, pandemic. For example, this year, things have been delayed and changed. So within the period of the fellowship, there's a lot of room for change and evolution. It's a conversation because life is pretty messy. It's really rare that you can sit together, sit down today, and plan the next three years perfectly. We know that it's going to evolve. And so part of the, the journey of leadership is figuring out how do I respond to changes constructively and appropriately. And some of that is about how do I think about my career and my trajectory and my, where I am and where I want to be. So those are all parts of the conversation that we will have together in the fellowship as you navigate um, both your life and your fellowship at the same time. Thank you, Heather. This next one is, a, is an extension of a previous question. She's at, or they are asking, I'm wondering if we can carry forward funds from year one to year two if we experience delays such as COVID, and if we have the autonomy to rebudget if needed to accomplish project goals. So the budget is, you know, it, it, the budget you put into your application is your best guess based on the project you're proposing when you apply, and the project you're proposing is not that detailed. And as Elena said, in the first six months of the project, you'll be working your ideas and, and refining your proposal very much. And we, we encourage that to happen in the first six months. By the end of the, the first six months, you'll actually resubmit a, your actual proposal of what you're going to be doing, along with a revised budget and a revised timeline. So you'll have that six months to refine and to make that all come together in collaboration with your mentors, with the National Program Office, with the FNAC. So there's a lot of conversation that happens. So you get six months to get that sorted out. And then once that becomes approved as your plan, your project, and your budget, then that's something on a quarterly basis we revisit. How are you doing with time? How are you doing with budget? And that's where you get a chance to talk about if there's any issues that are coming along and, and some problem solving around how to address it to keep it. Some changes are desired because you discover one thing and, and it, 
is suggest you need to move your project in a different direction, or, or you know, you're unable to recruit from a source that you thought you would be able to recruit from. Those kinds of things happen, and then you've got to revise and think about it. So it's a conversation as that goes forward. We want it to be a roadmap for you, but it's not. Um, you're not. It, it, you need to be able to move forward. We want to see the forward progress. But discussion of, of variance is something that's very much part of the process. Elena, do you want to add to that? No, I think that that, that explains it all, that this is part of a conversation. And I think what's, um, I will add one thing, that I think it's all part of this process of continuing to reevaluate and look at what makes most sense, given what we've already learned, where you're at, and where it makes sense to make the changes. So it is part of that ongoing conversation with your mentors and with us. So next question is, if uh, it would be appropriate to request funding for attending conferences or leadership development opportunities as part of the budget? Absolutely. And um, one of the things that, that the fellows do in the first couple of months of the fellowship is develop an individual development plan. And that plan is, is a roadmap for what's going to happen in terms of those activities that are not the project in the fellowship. And some of the core elements of the development plan are the curriculum that we're offering, and we offer a pretty robust curriculum. As you look at the curriculum, there might be things that you want to do in addition to that that are not part of what we offer, and those are absolutely appropriate to add to your budget. If you know of them now, that's fine. Many of our fellows have identified workshops, for example, in methods that they're interested in or experiences um, at, at business schools or other places where they're getting some insights into areas of leadership or innovation that are important for them. It also can deepen your scientific knowledge. So it might be enrolling in a course or doing something that, that's going to be enriching for you. So the idea, again, with this is to put it in your budget justification, why it's something that you're wanting to fund, and it would fund travel or it would fund your expenses associated with that. And then it would go in your individual development plan as one of the things that you would be doing during the fellowship. Thank you, Heather. This, this uh, next one is, my self-selected mentor is asking how much time they would be expected to provide me in this role. Any thoughts? Again, that's a topic that's between you and your mentor of what you need to accomplish, what you need them for, and how much time you think you're going to need from them. Um, we expect that you meet early on in the first month or so of the fellowship and have sign an agreement with your mentor about the, how you're going to work together, how often you're going to meet, and what you both need to do to be prepared for each other. So you'll talk about things like how much time do they need when you send them something to review and how do you want to handle um, conflict if that should come up. Those kinds of issues are part of the early conversation. So it's important for you to think about that with your mentor um, and decide. We're seeing most fellows are meeting with their mentors um, at least monthly. Some are meeting every other week. Um, it depends on the phase as well. Um, there's a lot of meeting going on right now because people are finalizing their projects, so quite a lot of discussion. I expect that might change a little bit when projects are underway, but it's hard to know. I think it's really up to you and with, with your mentor what's going to make sense. I saw there was a question about national um, mentors as well earlier on in the chat, and this is a fun process because once um, once you start the fellowship and you have a chance to meet the FNAC and you and you a uh, part of the initial immersion experience, the convocation, people start to think about things that they hadn't necessarily thought about that they could benefit from. And what we do is we sit down, I have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you about your current mentor and what they're doing for you and with you, and what, what do you think, where do you want to go, what do you want to learn while you're in the fellowship, and we brainstorm together the kinds of areas that you are seeking mentorship in. And it's usually things that are outside of the usual, the, the usual academic kind of a mentorship. So this last year, for example, we had people thinking um, about things like, you know, what about my um, policy? I'm interested in policy. I'm interested in system change. I'm interested in industry. I want to know how a business person thinks about these issues. 
So as we talk about those kinds of things, um, Elena and I work together to think about who might be potential mentors. We tap into our FNAC to see if there are people there who meet that, um, the needs of the, of the fellow, or we ask FNAC members to say, you know, we were looking for a person who has this skill set. Who do you know? And this year we were really excited. We found 10 fantastic, 11 fantastic national mentors who all readily agreed and are, are now part of the program. And so it's, it's an exciting process. And it's really about finding someone who helps take you to the next level and think differently. Okay, there's a question about uh, deadlines, holidays, and when the office will be closed and open should people have questions. Well, I'm hoping everybody spends their Thanksgiving doing what is meaningful to them and not working on the fellowship, um, including our staff. Um, we are very responsive to emails, so just send us emails, and this, this group is, is quite responsive, um, and it's, it's very helpful if you could think ahead as much as you can. You don't want to be at the last minute on your application, which is due December 1st, so take a look at that. Um, the university uh, does have the holidays of the 26th and 27th of November, so um, save up your questions and expect an answer on the Monday afterwards. Uh, but please, um, please think ahead. Look at the whole application soon because the time is getting short. So look at it now in case you do have questions because some of them may involve some adjustments on your part in how you work with your mentors and your dean. So the sooner the better. Any other questions, Monica or Kristen? I'm just going through, and no, I think we we caught um, all of them. There are one or two that we will follow up with you after, Heather, because um, they're more okay. individualized questions. All right, that sounds great. Well, we are so happy that you're here today. Thank you for being part of this conversation. And again, thank you so much for your interest in the fellowship. We're really eager to hear from you and to see your proposals and your ideas and um, hope that we can engage further in the future. Please don't hesitate to send questions to us. The website, um, is, uh, there's a, on the website is the, the email address, and everybody looks at that constantly, and, we're, and we try to be as, as very rapid in our response to you. We know your time is very valuable. So thank you so much for, um, for coming today. And we really look forward to talking to you soon.